Welcome to the New Chemists Podcast. We are so glad you are listening. Feel free to subscribe on Spotify and tell your friends and colleagues about the podcast. Welcome to the New Chemists Podcast. We are so glad you are listening. Welcome to the New Chemist Podcast. Bienvenidos al podcast del Nuevo Químico. Carlos Irza, testo podcast to New Chemist. Welcome by the podcast van the New Chemist. Bienvenue sur le podcast du Nouveau Chimiste. Bem-vindo ao podcast do Novo Químico. Welcome to the New Chemist Podcast. Work hard. Be value-driven. You can do it. You can grow and learn it. You can be the difference you and your community needs. Don't give up. We are here rooting and cheering for you. Don't give up. Travaillez dur. Soyez axé sur la valeur. Tu peux le faire. Vous pouvez grandir et l'apprendre. Vous pouvez être la différence dont vous et votre communauté avez besoin. N'abandonnez pas. Nous sommes ici pour vous encourager et vous encourager. N'abandonnez pas. Trabalhar duro. Seja orientado por valores. Você consegue. Você pode crescer e aprender. Você pode ser a diferença que você e sua comunidade precisam. Não desista. Estamos aqui torcendo e torcendo por você. Não desista. Duepse esclirá. Na odigite estinaxia. Boris na tocanis. Μπορείτε να μεγαλώσετε και να το μάθετε. Μπορείτε να είστε η διαφορά που χρειάζεστε εσείς και η κοινότητά σας. Μην τα παρατάς. Είμαστε εδώ για να σας ζητοκραυγάσουμε. Μην τα παρατάς. Τραβάχα δούρο. Σέα impulsado por el valor. Puedes hacerlo. Puedes crecer y aprenderlo. Usted puede ser la diferencia que usted y su comunidad necesitan. No te rindas, estamos aquí animándote y animándote. No te rindas. Berkhart. Wees waardig gedreven. Je kunt het. Je kunt groeien en leren. U kunt het verschil zijn dat u en uw gemeenschap nodig hebben. Geef niet op. We zijn hier om voor je te roten en te juichen. Geef niet op. Work hard. Be value driven. You can do it. You can grow and learn it. 
You can be the difference you and your community needs. Don't give up. We are here rooting and cheering for you. Don't give up. Thanks for listening. We're glad you were able to tune into this podcast. Once again, this is the new chemist where we discuss chemistry, which simply put is the science of change, as well as the other sciences, careers, community, research, and COVID-19. Thanks again for listening. Note, the views on this podcast represent those of my guests and I. You are very important, especially to us here at the New Chemist Podcasting Group. You listening in is significant. Vous êtes très important, surtout pour nous ici au New Chemist Podcasting Group. Votre écoute est significative. Usted es muy importante, especialmente para nosotros aquí en The Nuche Mist Podcasting Group. Usted escuchando, es significativo. Você é muito importante, especialmente para nós do The New Chemist Podcasting Group. Você ouvindo, é significativo. Είστε πολύ σημαντικοί, ειδικά για εμάς εδώ στο The New Chemist Podcasting Group. Το να ακούς είναι σημαντικό. Sie sind sehr wichtig, besonders für uns hier bei The New Chemist Podcasting Group. Es ist wichtig, dass du zuhörst. Je bent erg belangrijk, vooral voor ons hier bij The New Chemist Podcasting Group. Dat je meeluistert, is veel betekenend. You are very important. Especially to us here at The New Chemist Podcasting Group. You listening in is significant. Forår, tid og tilfældighed sker for os alle, efter at have arbejdet. Og vejlig som bachelorstuderende og modtaget et fuldt stipendium til BHD, skolen, er denne bog et aktuelt og et eksempel på at betale den videre til andre til gavn. Hvis du studerer kemi, giver denne bog faktisk en mulighed for at hjælpe dig med din succes som en supplerende guidebog. Hvis du vælger at bruge det, husk koncepterne, brug den snart kommende projektmappe, og brug forskellige metoder til sund positiv forstærkning. Målene for Neomonix inkluderer at lære de forenklede versioner af begreberne, ikke tunge teknikaliteter, som i mange tilfælde har eller vil have undtagelser. Det er rigtigt, at gentagelse og øvelse hjælper med at forstærke de begreber, du lærer. Du kan gøre det. Det er J.F. Biografier om forfatter. David Ferguson. David Ferguson er en kommende kandidatstuderende, 
som for nylig blev tildelt et fuldt stipendium til at studere kemi. Han har gået på både Georgia Institute of Technology og Tahyler University, hvor han dimitterede med udmærkelse. Han har været på dagens list ved begge institutioner og er blevet tildelt adskillige stipendier, mens han var på Georgia Tech og på Tahyler University. David Ferguson har forsket med Dr. C. Hagenis ved Georgia Tech Research Institute samt Dr. Daniel King og Dr. V. Sishula ved Tahyler University. Han stræber efter at tjene i den akademiske verden og hjælpe med at undervise og vejlede fremtidige studerende i naturvidenskab efter en kandidatskole. 2. Vincent Miranda Vincent Miranda er en seniorpræg med studerende ved Tahyler University, der arbejder på en bachelorgrad i biokemi. Han blev tildelt den mest fremragende studenterpris i organisk kemi, biokemi og organisk kemi ved Tahyler University. Han assisterede også Dr. Daniel Kaluga, Ph.D. i bachelorforskning i hemproteiner i en malaria-parasit, Plasmodium falciparum. Vincent er en kollegial basketballspiller for Tahyler University og fik en plads på Naja District 2 Academic Al District Team i 2020'erne. Efter at han har opnået sin bachelorgrad, stræber Vincent efter at gå på medicinsk skole og få sin MD. Dedikation Denne bog er dedikeret til de snesevis af mennesker, der har hjulpet og inspireret mig, specifikt mine forældre, min bror, min søster og de lærere på universitetet og gymnasiet, som hjalp med at gøre naturvidenskab tilgængelig for mig. Den nye kemist. Ophavsretssymbol til en new chemists publikations 242, DJF. Afsnit 1. Fonda. Organisk kemi er et fag, der kræver indsats, fokus og dygtighed. Disse fundamenter er blevet udvalgt efter guidet gennemgang og observation af, hvilke begreber der letter og understøtter en god forståelse, efterhånden som en studerende udvikler sig gennem denne disciplin i kemi. Disse fundamenter fra delen til metallerne fremhæver med konceptuelt fokus, nøgleidéer, punkter og hukommelseshjælpemidler til at understøtte din succes inden for organisk kemi. At lære organisk kemi svarer til at bygge et hus, det kræver tid, dygtighed og vedholdende indsats. Lad os begynde. Konceptudvikling 1. Introduktion. Mål. Lær de vigtigste definitioner. Forstå nøgleidéerne og relevansen af Lewis punktstrukturer. Forstå nogle forenklede kvantemekaniske begreber. Organiske molekyler. Organiske molekyler kan defineres som flere atomer forbundet eller bundet sammen, lavet primært af kulstof. Kort sagt er organiske molekyler kulstofbaserede molekyler. Figur 1,1 Dette billede viser bindingslinjestrukturen af cyanocobalamin, også kendt som vitamin B12. Disse molekyler kan have eller ikke have den samme molekylære formel. I tilfælde hvor molekylformlen er den samme, men strukturen er ikke den samme, strukturelle isomerer. Nogle eksempler omfatter acetone og dimethylethor. Figur 1,2 Dette billede viser to strukturelle, konstitutionelle, isomerer acetone til venstre og dimethylethor til højre. Forfatningen eller forbindelsen er ikke den samme, konstitutionelle isomerer. Bemærk at isomerne nævnt tidligere, konstitutionelle, under tiden ombyttes med udtrykket strukturelle. Arrangementet i 3D-rund er ikke det samme, større isomere. Figur 1,3 Dette billede viser et par enantiomere, fra venstre mod højre, S-1 brum 1 klør et hen og R-1 brum 1 klør et hen, underklasser af større isomere. Optiske isomerer af molekyler, der roterer lys forskelligt, og deres spejlbilleder er ikke superposable, ellers kendt som enantiomerer er normalt betegnet med E, Z, R eller S. Geometriske isomerer, som er molekyler, der har ikke identiske spejlbilleder, og arrangementet omkring dobbeltbindingens plan er forskelligt, det vil sige cis eller trans. Organiske molekyler kan være lineære. 
Lineær molekylær form observeres i HCN, hydroomsyanid, eller acetylen, C2 timer 2, eller den kan stadig være plan, men trional, såsom formaldehyd. Som er trional plan. Figur 1,4 Denne figur viser bindingslinjestrukturerne, fra venstre mod højre, af hydroomsyanid, acetylen og formaldehyd. Også molekylet kan have et 3D-arrangement såsom metan, der eksisterer som et tetraedrisk molekyle. Figur 1,5 Denne figur viser bindingslinjestrukturerne af metan og formaldehyd. Diagrammatisk forklaring af molekyler og forbindelser. Figur 1,6 Denne figur viser forskelle og sammenhænge mellem molekyler og forbindelser. Strukturen af 3D-molekyler. Strukturen af tredimensionelle, 3D, molekyler kan forudsiges ved hjælp af en anvendelse af korrekt tegnede Lewis bundstrukturer, som kaldes balance shell elektron repulsion theory VSEPR. VSEPR involverer valensbindingsteori, der viser alle valenselektroner og inkluderer bindende og ikke bindende elektroner, i nogle tilfælde benævnt ensomme par, og maksimering af adskillelse i 3D-rum for at minimere frastøtninger. Forbundet med Coulomb's lov i at større afstand minimere potentialet, energi for delinger for lignende ladninger. VSEPR er et alternativ, der kan informere og starte rejsen med at forstå molekylær geometri, hvad enten det er de lineære aldyner. Trionale plane arrangementer af karbonatomerne i nogle algener eller de tetraedriske arrangementer af karbonatomerne omkring nogle karbonatomer i alkaner. Et andet alternativ involverer at bruge kvantemekanik, der bruger bølgefunktioner, der er matematiske beskrivelser af elektronsandsynlighedsfordelinger til at producere atomarer og vitaler. Der er nogle begrænsninger i denne metode, da den vedrører nøjagtighed som med den tidligere metode, VSEPR, i betragtning af de teoretiske forenklinger, der anvendes. Overordnet set er målet at få en bedre forståelse af, hvad der sker i naturen. For eksempel med kvantemekanik kan vi træde ind i hybridiseringsteori og bruge matematisk blanding af bølgefunktioner til at fremme vores forståelse af, hvad der observeres i naturen. Med samme mål kan vi gennem idéer i balancebånd til at forudsige bindingsvinklerne for metan, specifikt den intramolekylære HH-bindingsvinkel i metan, afvielser observeres, og hybridisering tegner sig for disse afvielser med forklaringer. Disse forklaringer indebærer. Lineære arrangementer har karbonatomer, der er sp hybridiseret 1SP plus 2PR. Trionale plane arrangementer har karbonatomer, der er sp 2 hybridiseret 1SP2 plus 1P. Tetraedriske arrangementer har karbonatomer, der er sp 3 hybridiseret 1SP3 plus 0P. Andre hybridiseringer forekommer mindre hyppigt i almindelig organisk kemi, men med højere geometrier, der er almindelige med organiske forbindelser, kan der forekomme trionale bipyramidale SP3D, eller octaedriske SP3D2. Bemærk, kvantemekanik involverer også brugen af molekylær orbitalteori til at forstå andre interaktioner, men det vil blive diskuteret i appendix. Med samme fokus gør kvantemekanikken også det muligt for kemikere at tale om regionale elektrontætheder, såsom langs den internukleære akse, Sima-binding, eller langs x, y, z, vinkelrette akser, de bindinger. Disse idéer kan anvendes til bindingsarrangementer, såsom Sima-bindinger, der forekommer i enkelt bindinger. Sam dobbelt bindinger, der besidder Sima-bindinger og en di binding Derudover findes der i triple bindinger en Sima-binding og to di bindinger Spørgsmål. Let. Hvad er organisk kemi? Og hvad er dens historiske oprindelse? Tip. Frederik Wohler og 1828. Hvad er en klasse af organiske forbindelser? Hvad er tre forskellige typer isomerer? Medium. Forklar valensbindingsteorien i generelle simple termer. 
Hvad er et molekylært eksempel, hvor valensspændingsteori ikke præcist forklarer, hvad der sker i molekyler? Hårdt. Hvad er hybridiseringen af karbonatomerne i acetonitril? Hvad er bedregnelserne for sima og de forbindingerne i acetonitril? Konceptudvikling 2. Funktionelle grupper og andre idéer. Mål. Forstå, hvad en funktionel gruppe er. Forstå formatet for organisk nomenklatur. Forstå rollen af intermolekylære kræfter, M for. Funktionelle grupper er karakteristiske dele af molekyler, der formidler specifikke kemiske egenskaber til de molekyler, der besidder dem. Funktionelle grupper gør mange ting, men hovedsageligt giver de os mulighed for at opdele information om molekyler, forbindelser og reaktioner. Funktionelle grupper giver os indsigt i kemiske interaktioner såsom intermolekylære interaktioner, samt giver os mere information om at forstå molekylers egenskaber. Dette inkluderer de fysiske egenskaber, punkter og smeltepunkter, og opløseligheder. I betragtning af anvendeligheden af funktionelle grupper har de også et karakteristisk molekylært fingeraftryk, der detekteres på mange måder, nemlig i spektre, hvilket vil blive diskuteret i en senere konceptudvikling. Konceptudvikling 6. Figur 2,1 Disse molekyler anført ovenfor formidler forskellige kemiske egenskaber og fysiske egenskaber til det molekyle, der besidder disse dele. Fra venstre mod højre, hydroxyl, svålhydryl og benzen, første række, karboxylat, fenol, tiopin, anden række, og furan, sidste række. Typer af molekyler og deres egenskaber. Der er flere typer molekyler i verden, men i disciplinen organisk kemi er der specifikke molekyler, der diskuteres ofte, herunder disse. Alkaner. Alkaner ellers kendt som paraffiner af mættede kulprinter og alifatiske forbindelser. Disse molekyler danner en række homologer med en gentagende mæthylden, CH2, enhed, og med den almene form LCNH2N plus 2, og slutter med suffixet ane. For eksempel i stigende rækkefølge fra 1 til 5. Metan CH4, ethan, C2 og 6, propan, C3 og 8. Butan C4 timer 10. Pentan C5 12. Følgende prefikser er hex. 6 karbonatomer. Hept. 7 karbonatomer. 8. 8 karbonatomer. Ikke. 9 karbonatomer. Og dik. 10 karbonatomer. Disse prefikser fra midt til dik er anvendelige i hele navngivningen af organiske forbindelser. Alkaner, algener, algyner, alkoholer og så videre. Algenes, algener, ellers kendt som olefiner, er umiddelbart karbonhydrider, og de betragtes som alifatiske forbindelser. De indeholder mindst en dobbeltbinding, der danner en homologserie med formlen CNH2N. Disse molekyler slutter med ensen, ene. Algyner, algyner ellers kendt som acetylner, er umiddelbart forbindelser med en tredobbeltbinding. Disse molekyler danner en homologserie med en generel form LCNH2N2. Disse molekyler ender med ensen yne. Der er adskillige andre molekyler, der er en homologserie inden for deres grupper, herunder karboxylser, CNH2N plus 1K, og alle hedder. CNH2N plus 1 Alkoholer. Alkoholer. Hvis vigtigste funktionelle gruppe til identifikation af hydroxylgruppen, OH, det er især prioriteret i nomenklaturpraksis, undtagelser omfatter karboxylser ifølge IUPAC. Alkoholer indeholder en eller flere hydroxyler, der danner en homologserie, CNH2N plus 1 OH. Alkoholer er alifatiske og ender typisk med ensen ud. Intermolekylære kræfter og andre egenskaber. Med funktionelle grupper følger visse egenskaber, såsom specifikke punkter og smeltepunkter, såvel som kritiske temperaturer, den temperatur, omkring hvilken en damp ikke let undergår en faseændring til en væske, og mange andre fysiske egenskaber. 
men under overfladen af fysiske egenskaber er de kemiske egenskaber eller interaktioner kendt som intermolekylære kræfter, som påvirker og muliggør sammenlignende forudsigelser og fysiske egenskaber. Der er nemlig nøglekræfter at huske. Dipol dipol kræfter. Disse er kræfter, der opstår mellem molekyler, intermolekylære, med et dipol moment eller signifikant elektrisk konstant. Disse molekyler er ellers kendt som polære. Disse intermolekylære kræfter, M for, er relativt stærke. En relativt stærkere version af denne kraft er H-bindingen intermolekylære kraft. Hydronbinding. Hydronbinding er en stærkere kraft, nogle gange omtalt som en stærk dipol dipol kraft. Dette er en relativt stærk, nogle anser den for stærkest, af inferne. Det forekommer i vand og andre molekyler med hydronbindinger til N, O eller F. Ion dipol. Dette sker mellem ioner og polære molekyler, for eksempel med solvatisering af natriumklorikrystaller i vand. London Dispersion Forces Londons spredningskræfter forekommer i alle molekyler og er baseret på kolumbiske interaktioner mellem forbigående, i det væsentlige midlertidige, dipoler. Disse elektrostatiske kræfter resulterer i forbigående interaktioner mellem molekyler. Fand der voldstyrker. Nu inkluderer en sværere kraft, der består af to slags, Van der Vols kraften, som diskuteres kort her og mere uddybning kan findes i andre tekster. Det er værd at bemærke, at Imfor og deres styrker er baseret på funktionelle grupper, kemisk struktur og typerne af kemisk binding i disse molekyler. Kemisk binding. Polar kovalent binding. Kovalent binding opstår mellem atomer med betydelige elektronegativitetsforskelle. Specifikt forekommer denne binding med heteroatomer, som refererer til forskellige ikke-metalatomer. Mange gange bruges Pauling-skalaen som reference for intervaller for at bestemme typen af bindingsarrangement, der forekommer mellem atomer, hvis lindning. Selvom det i nogle tilfælde betragtes som en teoretisk konstruktion, ses på et spektrum, vil polær kovalent binding eksistere omkring midten. Kovalent binding. Dette er næsten i en anden ende af bindingsspektret, hvor der er en mindre signifikant forskel i elektronegativitet. Ionisk. Dette er i den anden ende af bindingsspektret. Dette sker mellem metaller og ikke metaller. For eksempel i natriumklorid er der stor forskel på elektronegativitet. Løsning. Solvation er afhængig af mange faktorer. Herunder princippet ligesom opløser ligesom, og idéer som hydrofilicitet og hydrofobicitet. Hydrofilicitet og hydrofobicitet. Disse udtryk refererer til molekylernes holdning i forhold til vand, uanset om det har en signifikant affinitet til vand, hydrofil, vandelskende, eller en mindre signifikant affinitet til vand, hydrofod, vandhædende. Molekylernes tendens er som følger. Polære og ioniske forbindelser har en tendens til at være hydrofile sammenlignet med kovalente og ikke polære forbindelser, som har tendens til at være hydrofobe. Nomenklatur. Nomenklatur i henhold til IUPAC er baseret på fire hoveddele. Prefixet, dette angiver normalt antallet af hver substituent eller funktionel gruppe tilknytning af. Prefixer omfatter de tre tetra. Lågkanten, som er det tal, der beskriver den funktionelle gruppe tilknytning eller substituenternes position. Tredje, forældrekæden, dette er normalt den længste sammenhængende kæde i molekylet. Suffixet, dette er baseret på den præsiderende eller prioriterede funktionelle gruppe, kæde eller bindingsarrangement, det vil sige enkelt, dobbelt eller tredobbelt. Suffixer er typisk klassiske i slutningen med an, alkaner, in, algener, yn, algyner, amin, amin, amid, amid, o, i, c, karboxylser, ætte, ester, in, keton, dehyd, allehyd. Vigtigt at bemærke, alkoholens funktionelle gruppe, hydroxyl, oh, prioriteres normalt overordnet. 
substituenter er transkriberet eller skitseret i navnet baseret på den relative alfabetiske rækkefølge, så ephil før methil, og det mønster fortsætter. Overordnet nøgleidé, prefix losant pangchain suffix, generelt. En hver yderligere uddybning vil blive diskuteret senere i teksten. Spørgsmål. Let. Hvad er en funktionel gruppe og nævn flere eksempler på funktionelle grupper? Tip. OH. Hvad er tre typer organiske molekyler? Hvad er en intermolekylær kraft? Medium. Forklar dibol dibol kræfter. Hvad er et molekylært eksempel? hvor intermolekylære kræfter forklarer en fysisk egenskab såsom kogepunkt. Hårdt. Hvad er en forskel mellem hydroombinding og London dispositionskræfter? Forklar den overordnede proces med at navngive simple organiske forbindelser. Konceptudvikling 3. Strukturer, konformationer og projektioner. Mål. Forstå og kunne tegne Lewis elektronprikstrukturer kondenserede strukturer og båndligende strukturer. Forstå og kunne tegne forskellige konformationer, primært den af cyklohexan. Forstå og kunne tegne og identificere Fischer-projektioner og Neumann-projektioner. Strukturer. Strukturer er diagrammatiske repræsentationer af forskellige molekyler, og de giver et middel til at forstå, hvad der sker i naturen. Der er en række forskellige strukturer, der bruges i kemi. De vigtigste eksempler i den følgende diskussion vil være Lewis elektronprikstrukturer, kondenserede strukturer og båndligende strukturer. Lewis elektronprikstrukturer. Lewis prikstrukturer er bygget på nogle nøgleidéer såsom atomets valens og optæbrillen. Der er også specifikke undtagelser for periode 3 og senere. Valens Valens refererer til mængden af elektroner et atom vil miste, mange gange resulterer i en positiv lade ion, kation, forstærkning, mange gange resulterer i en negativ lade ion, anion, eller andel, som typisk forekommer i kovalente molekyler. For at have en stabil ellers elektronkonfiguration, valens kan bestemmes ved hjælp af det periodiske system, gruppenummeret, Lodrette kolonnenumre i det periodiske system er betegnet valensen. Denne valen svarer normalt til ladning eller oxidationsstal, og des efterfølgende tegn afhænger af atomdybden, des reaktivitet og hvad det reagerer med. Et nøglepunkt at bemærke. Valens kan vises hurtigt ved hjælp af Lewis punktstrukturer, og orbital arrangement kan forklares enkelt, men ikke fuldstændigt i nøjagtighed ved hjælp af Bohr-modellen. Bohr-modellen involverer at bruge atomsymbolet omgivet af cirkler, der repræsenterer elektronens orbital med prikker, der symboliserer elektronerne. Bohr-modellen falder på nogle måder sammen med atomets elektronkonfiguration. Og det trækker. Optætreglen er et princip med anvendelser i resonansteori, simple kemiske mekanismer og reaktioner. Optætreglen er baseret på ideen om, at atomer får, deler eller mister elektroner for at få en komplet optæt, 8 ydre elektroner. Der er undtagelser, for eksempel kan nogle atomer miste elektroner for at besidde elektronkonfigurationen af helium, 2 ydre elektroner. Men for de fleste atomer i periode 1 og periode 2 i det periodiske system, adlyder disse elementer generelt op til brillen. Denne regel er nyttig til at forudsige reaktivitet og blot forklare begrundelsen for visse kemiske reaktioner. Specifik undtagelse for periode 3 og frem. Afhængigt af atomet, dets reaktivitet og hvad det reagerer med, er der undtagelser fra op til brillen. For eksempel med visse metalatomer såsom aluminium, al og andre, inklusive jern, ikke metaller såsom fosfor og selen og eddelgasser såsom xenon. Der er mange undtagelser, men reglen giver stadig en ramme for konceptuel udvikling. Metode til at skrive Lewis elektron strukturer. For atomer ioner. For atomer og ioner skal du overveje primært gruppenummeret og elektronkonfigurationen. For eksempel klor eller brint Lewis elektron struktur. 
figur 3,1 af figuren ovenfor viser Lewis elektronprikstrukturerne af henholdsvis et kloratom og et brintatom fra venstre mod højre. For molekyler. A start med at bestemme det samlede antal elektroner blandt atomerne i molekylet. Tegn derefter enkeltbindinger mellem hvert atom. Træk to elektroner for hver enkeltbinding fra den samlede elektron. Tælle. Tilføj ekstra bindinger, hvor det er nødvendigt, for eksempel for kulstof-oxygenbindinger i alle heder og ketoner er bindingsarrangementet typisk i form af en dobbeltbinding. Kend og observer tendenserne. Når alle de nødvendige ekstra bindinger er blevet angivet, trækkes den korrekte mængde elektroner fra for de ekstra bindinger, der er tilføjet. Typisk med de resterende elektroner betegne dem som indlige par omkring de relevante atomer. Kondenserede strukturer Kondenserede strukturer er vigtige i processen med at forstå, hvad bindingslinjestrukturer repræsenterer og viser. I kondenserede strukturer er alle printerne vist bundet til karbonerne for eksempel. Figur 3,1b Figuren ovenfor viser den kondenserede struktur af s 2 brombutan Bondline struktur. Bondline struktur er det næste trin efter kondenserede strukturer. Disse viser kun kulstofstrukturen med hvert kulstof repræsenteret af en bøjning i kæden og printen ikke angivet, men udledt eller antaget til punktet eller en komplet optæt omkring kulstofatomet. Dette betyder, at hydroenerne ikke er vist, men underforstået til det punkt, at valensen af kulstof er opfyldt. For eksempel. Lige med. Figur 3,2 strukturerne ovenfor viser bindingslinjestrukturen af butan, under hvilken er den kondenserede struktur af butan. Bindingslinjestrukturer er nyttige og effektive. Bemærk. I opdagelsen af strukturen af bensen, Psykohexatien eller cyklohexatri 1,35 bestemte August Kegel en struktur af et molekyle med seks kulstofringe med skiftende enkelt- og dobbeltbindinger. Denne struktur, som ses nedenfor, er et godt forbrændingspunkt fra kondenserede strukturer til bindingslinjestrukturer. Lige med figur 3,3 figuren ovenfor viser, fra venstre mod højre, en version af kegulstrukturen af bensen og bindingslinjestrukturen af bensen. Konformationer Konformationer af molekyler, der kun adskiller sig ved rotationer omkring enkeltbindinger, ellers karakteriseret som simabindinger. Disse alternative rotationer påvirker molekylernes potentielle energier enten stigende, som det ses i den formørkede konformation, eller mindske den som det ses i antikonformationen. Konformationernes potentielle energier tilskrives ringspændingen, som er baseret på vinkelspændingen og torsionsspændingen. Vinkelspænding er forsaget af de alternative bindingsvinkler, der har afviget fra de idealiserede bindingsvinkler foreslået i VSEPR. Torsionsbelastning er forsaget af frastøtning på grund af spredningskræfterne, en intermolekylær kraft, og dette kan forsage steriske hindringer. Konformationer kan eksperimentelt beskrives ved hjælp af en graf over den dihedrale vinkel versus potentiel energi. Typisk blotte cyklohexan, der viser den potentielle energi af de forskellige konformationer i stigende potentielle energier. Stolen, indsæt billede, konformation med den laveste potentielle energi, derefter twist bordet, indsæt billede. Efterfuldt af bådens konformation, indsæt billede, og endelig har halvstolen, indsæt billede, den relativt højeste potentielle energi blandt cyklohexan-konformationerne. Stol, twist, både. Bådebygning halvstol. Figur 3,4 af bindingslinjestrukturerne af de forskellige konformationer af cyklohexan. Figur 3,4 b figuren ovenfor. Ved hjælp af relative tilnærmelser af potentiel energi, viser stabiliteten af de forskellige konformationer af cyklohexan, nemlig i stigende rækkefølge af stabilitet, stol, twist, båd, båd, halvstol. Fremskrivninger, 
Inden for kemi er der mange typer projektioner, men to, der ofte stødes på, er Neumann-projektionen og Fischer-projektionen. Neumann-projektioner er strukturer fra et specifikt perspektiv. Vi ser ned på en specifik enkelt binding mellem atomer og tegner de andre bindinger i forhold til disse to atomer. For eksempel tegnes butan. Visualiser et øje, der kigger ned C2-C3 af butan for at tegne Neumann-projektionen. Figur 3,5 Figuren ovenfor viser et øje, der kigger ned ad bindingslinjedelen med kulstof 2 og 3 i butan for at tegne Neumann-projektionen. Figur 3,6 Figuren ovenfor viser en simpel Neumann-projektion af butan. Fischer-projektioner involverer en anden repræsentation fra et andet perspektiv. Molekylet trækkes fra top til bund, normalt med det anomere kulstof i en udpeget ende. Generelt er de funktionelle gruppevedhæftninger på siderne, der ses som kiler, der er ude af planet for. Papiret og toppen og bunden af projektionen ses som grupper af de stiblede, som er i papirets plan. En anden bindingsbetegnelse, der bruges, er den snurrede linje, som repræsenterer en enkelt binding ud og bag ved papirets plan. Denne projektion bruges typisk med kulhydrater, især simple kulhydrater. Figur 3,7 Figuren vist ovenfor viser hydroenatomet på den stiblede binding og bromatomet på kildebindingen i molekylet er en brom en klør et hagen. Den snodede linje er vist i taliet om et molekylet til højre for papiret. Spørgsmål. Let. Hvad er Lewis elektronprikstrukturen af oxygen? Tip. Den har 6 valenselektroner. Hvad er de vigtigste idéer til at tegne Lewis elektronprikstrukturer? Forklar begrebet valens. Medium. Forklar optæbrillen. Hvad er en undtagelse fra optæbrillen? Hårdt. Tegne bondligne strukturen for antrasen. Forklar den overordnede rækkefølge af stabilitet for cyklohexankonformationerne. Tip. Kræver noget nyttig forskning, muligvis i en gruppe. Konceptudvikling 4. Koalitet og isomerisme. Mål. Lær definitioner af nøgleord som isomer, chiral og konformers forstå begreber om større isomerisme og chiralitet forstå label fandt hofreglen. Isomer. Isomer, som defineret tidligere, er molekyler med den samme molekylære formel, men forskellige i strukturelt arrangement, rundt forbindelse eller geometri omkring et bindingsarrangement. Alle de førnævnte forskelle definerer en underklasse af isomerer, det vil sig strukturelle, strukturelle isomerer, arrangement i rummet, større isomerer, eller forbindelse, konstitutionelle isomerer. Hver underklasse har sin egen betydning, men i dette konceptudvikling vil uddybninger primært ske på større isomerer. Større isomerer, Større isomerer, eller rumlige isomerer, er molekyler med den samme molekylære formel, men forskellige tredimensionelle rumlige arrangementer. En større isomer har et større center, som er et sted i molekylet, hvor udvekslingen af to grupper i rummet resulterer i en ny større isomer. En undergruppe af stereogene centre er et chiralt center, som typisk refererer til et stereogent center med en sp 3 hybrid isering eller til triadrisk geometri. Edward chiralt center er et stereogent center, men ikke Edward stereogent center er et chiralt center. Stereoisomere kan yderligere opdeles i tre andre kategorier end ansomere, diastereomere og atropisomere. En ansomere Enantiomere er optiske isomerer. Disse optiske isomerer er molekyler, der er ikke superposable spejlbilleder af hinanden. Enantiomere har typisk chirale centre. Enantiomere er meget betydningsfulde i den farmaceutiske industri med specifikke enantiomere i lægemidler, som har specifikke virkninger. Dette ses med de klassiske eksempler på talidomid, ibuprofen og davon hvor større specificitet bidrager med en stor rolle i at bestemme terapeutisk potentiale og terapeutiske effekter. Figur 4,1 Figuren ovenfor viser, fra venstre mod højre, 
Bindingslinjestrukturerne af molekylerne, talidomid, ibuprofen og davon. En ansomere er typisk betegnet med sinetærne med absolut konfiration, som er R, rectus og S, sinister. Figur 4,2 figuren ovenfor viser fra venstre mod højre orienteringen forbundet med de forskellige absolute konfigurationer. Blandinger af begge enantiomere kaldes racemiske, normalt er disse blandinger af lige stor andele. Processen med at danne begge enantiomere som produkter er kendt som racemissering. Produktet af ovennævnte proces er kendt som et racemat. Disse molekyler er også udpeget af den relative konfiguration, som er højredrejende, d plus, eller venstredrejende, l. Begreberne højredrejende og venstredrejende refererer til den optiske rotation, eller hvordan molekylerne roterer lys, hvilket er venstredrejning, venstredrejning, eller højredrejning af lys, højredreje. Indsæt billede af optisk polarimeter, tegn i Microsoft Word. Også den udstrækning, hvor i lyset roteres, angives normalt ved brug af specifik rotation. Der er andre applikationer med optisk spredning, polarimetri, cirkulær dikroisme og andre polaritets fænomener. Tildeling af konfigurationer. Relative konfigurationer. Dextrodatøj, plus, eller leverodatøj, skal tildeles eksperimentelt typisk ved korrekt anvendelse af en optisk enhed, såsom et polarimeter, for at observere og måle, hvordan molekylet roterer lys, og i hvilken grad eller grad det roterer det. Absolute konfigurationer Absolute konfigurationer kan tildeles ved hjælp af et prioriteret, numerisk mærkningssystem kaldet kan indgold prioritetsreglerne. Disse regler giver prioritet baseret på atommasse. Større atomer har den højeste prioritet, 1, og de mindste eller mindst vejende atomer har den mindste prioritet, typisk brint i mange molekyler. For eksempel en brom en klopropan er prioritet angivet. Brom prioriteres 1. Klor følger med prioritet 2. Et hen prioriteres 3. Brint prioriteres 4. Som det ses nedenfor, så det er S1 brum 1 klopropan. Figur 4,3 figuren ovenfor viser billedet af bindingslinjestrukturen af S1 brum 1 klopropan. Diastereomere. Dette er en underklasse af optiske isomere også kendt som geometriske isomere. Diastereomere er isomere med den samme molekylære formel, men forskellige arrangementer i rummet, hvilket resulterer i ikke identiske spejlbilleder. Disse kan typisk identificeres ved først at tildele den absolute konfiguration af de stereogene centre og derefter sammenligne spejlbillederne for at bestemme, om de er identiske eller ej. Disse trin, der er nævnt tidligere, er i en foreslået rækkefølge. Underklasser af diastereomere er cis transisomere og konformer, som yderligere kan opdeles i rotamere. EZ-isomeri og cis-transisomeri. Da højredrejende og venstredrejende er relativ tildeling for stereokemi, så er cis- og trans. Cis- og transisomerisme giver mulighed for at angive de rumlige arrangementer baseret på lignende grupper, for eksempel trans 1,2 dikleithen eller cis 1,2 dikleithen. Dette relative system, cis eller trans, kan blive uklart meget hurtigt, så for at give et mere omhyggeligt system bruges kan indgold prelo prioritetsreglerne til at mærke substituenterne på det dobbelte bind ved hjælp af EZ. En down eller modsat, komma set usammen eller samme side. Dette system før nævnte giver mere klarhed med stereokemi. Som tidligere nævnt giver kan indgold prelo prioritetsreglerne den højeste prioritet, en til den største substituent eller substituenten med den største atommasse, og følgende substituenter er mærket med tallene 2,3,4, baseret på atommasserne. Konformers og rotamers. En konformer er et arrangement eller konformation af et molekyle baseret på rotation af enkeltbindinger, der resulterede i et potentielt energiminimum. 
Et klassisk eksempel på en konformer er med cyklohexan, hvor du har forskellige konformer repræsenteret i grafen nedenfor. Figur 3,4 b figuren ovenfor, ved hjælp af relative tilnærmelser af potentiel energi, viser stabiliteten af de forskellige konformationer af cyklohexan, nemlig i stigende rækkefølge af stabilitet, stol, tvist, boat, båd, halvstol. En rotamer er blot en konformation af et molekyle, der er et resultat af en anden rotation af molekylets enkeltbindinger. Anomer en isomer dannet på grund af en geometrisk variation fundet ved visse atomer i specifikke molekyler. Anomer ses og beskrives typisk i kulhydrat, hvor betegnelsen eller anvendes. Figur 4,4 figuren ovenfor viser to forskellige anomer og er det glukoporanose. Edimos. En edimer, der normalt findes i diasterumere par, er en større isomer, der adskiller sig i konfiguration på et vort punkt i molekylet, hvor ændring af positionen af de to substituenter resulterer i dansen af en ny større isomer. Grundlæggende er en edimer en isomer, der adskiller sig i konfiguration ved et vort større center. Figur 4,5 figuren ovenfor viser et dimer, i dette tilfælde en anchomere, R og S, af to klopotan. Lebel fandt hofregel. Hvis der er en stereogene centre, med fire forskellige substituenter knyttet, er der to en forskellige større isomerer mulige. Spørgsmål. Let. Hvad er en isomer? Tip. Samme molekylformel, men hvad er de forskellige typer af isomerer? Forklar begrebet en anchomere. Fjerde. Hvad er et rasematte? Medium. Forklar hvad en diastereomer Hvad er to underklasser af diastereomere? Hårdt. Forklar kan indgold prelog prioritetsreglerne for at udpege absolut konfiguration. 
Koncept udvikling 5. Nukleofilicitet og elektrofilicitet. Mål. Lær definitionerne af nukleofilicitet og elektrofilicitet. Forstå tendenserne med nukleofilicitet og basicitet eller elektrofilicitet og surhedsprave. Forstå forskellene med nukleofilicitet og basicitet eller elektrofilicitet og surhedsprave. Nukleofilicitet. Nukleofilicitet er et kinetisk begreb, der beskriver affiniteten af et atom eller et molekyle til kernen af et andet atom, som er positivt ladet. Med den tilsigtede betydning af kerneelskende er udtrykket meget vigtigt for at forstå reaktioner og deres mekanismer. Nukleofilicitet refererer til hvor villig, i hvilken grad eller med hvilken hastighed er et atom eller molekyle, der donerer sin elektrontæthed til et andet atom eller molekyle. Graden af nukleofilicitet er defineret af reaktionshastigheden, specifikt hastigheden af elektronensidets donation. Trinks. Generelt følger nukleofilicitet, når man sammenligner et lignende atom i flere molekyler, Lewis basicitet. Dette betyder, at efterhånden som Lewis basicitet øges, øges nukleofilicitet og omvendt for det samme atom i et sæt af flere molekyler. Også når et nukleofilt atom er anderledes, er der muligvis ingen sammenhæng mellem nukleofilicitet og basicitet. Da de på momenterne for hvert atom eller molekyle kan være forskellige, hvilket påvirker polariserbarheden, som er en stor afgørende faktor i nukleofilicitet. Nukleofilicitets årsager og virkninger. Nukleofilicitet er grundlæggende funderet i de kolumbiske kræfter. Dette forklarer os ved, at lignende ladninger frastøder eller får et system til at have en ugunstigt høj potentiel energi og i modsætning til ladninger tiltrækker eller får systemet til at have en gunstig lav potentiel energi. En af årsagerne er kolumbik, de andre faktorer er relateret til polariserbarhed, inklusive ladning, Q og størrelse, R og det omgivende reaktionsmiljø. Nogle af virkningerne af nukleofilicitet er, at det fører til dansen af produkter ved at komplementer til reaktionen. Det kan resultere i danse eller bredning af bindinger. Som det senere ses det berygtede nukleofile angreb og nukleofile Elektrofilicitet Elektrofilicitet er et kinetisk begreb. Det involverer den reaktion, hvor der er accept af et elektronpar. En elektrofil er defineret som en elektronpar accepter eller et atom eller molekylær del, der er elektronelskende elektrofil. Dette udtryk giver indsigt i mekanisme eller reaktioner såsom elektrofil aromatisk substitution, elektrofil substitution og elektrofil tilsætning. Elektrofilicitet er per definition modbegrebet til nukleofilicitet. Det involverer mål, grad eller omfang, kinetisk set, af, hvor meget et atom eller molekyle er villig til at acceptere elektrontæthed fra et andet atom eller molekyle. Trends. Ræk ordlyd og idéer. Nogle generelle tendenser følger tendensen til elektronegativitet hvor elektrofilrangen svarer til det elektrofile indeks, nemlig F, C, L, I, S, 0, 2, Na, og denne række følge følger elektronegativitetsrangeringen. Lewis urhedsprang har en tendens til at være parallel med tendensen til elektrofilicitet, i og med at elektrofile atomer har tendens til at acceptere elektronpar. Faktisk kaldes en Lewis syre en elektrofil. Konceptuelle forbindelser. Dette er en mulig konceptuel vej til at forbinde tomodynamiske ligevægtsbærere med tre med kinetiske parametre. Nukleofilicitet og Lewis basicitet. Som tidligere nævnt har nukleofilicitet, for det samme atom i en række molekyler, tendens til at følge tendensen med Lewis basicitet. Såvel som i nogle tilfælde er der parallelle for tre parametre i den nukleofilicitet, Lewis basicitet og elektropositivitet har tendens til at følge den samme tendens. 
Også nukleofilicitet og PKB har tendens til at følge lignende tendenser i nogle tilfælde. Såvel som med elektrofilicitet, for det samme atom i en række molekyler, har det en tendens til at følge tendensen med levisurhedsgrad. Desuden har elektrofilicitet og elektronegativitet i nogle tilfælde tendenser i samme retning. Samtidig har elektronegativitet og B kan tendens til at have tendenser i samme retning. Forbindelsen mellem disse to felter, B kan og BKB, dog tilstandsspecifik ved 25 grader Celsius, og endda stofspecifik, inkluderer brugen af ligningen B kan plus BKB lige med 14. Spørgsmål. Let. Hvad er nogle nøgleidéer forbundet med begrebet nukleofilicitet? Tip. Kinetisk. Hvad er nogle af de vigtigste tendenser med nukleofilicitet? Medium. Forklar sammenhængen mellem Lewis basicitet og nukleofilicitet. Hvad er forbindelsen mellem Lewis acididy og elektrofilicity? Hårdt. Forklar betydningen af BKB med nogle aspekter af begrebet nukle. Good evening students, it is so good, so exciting to have you in lecture today. It's definitely a privilege or honor, it is a treat. Just want to remind everyone, you are not alone. This is an academic community. Remember to get help from university services if needed. Never give up, never give up, keep trying. We're here to help you be intelligent, successful, and responsible scientists. However, at the end of the day, you must be responsible, intelligent, and hardworking. I want to remind you, don't give up. It may be challenging, it may be hard. Find strategies, find resources, meet with people, network, do what you can. It's worth it. You are smart enough, you are good enough, you are worth the effort and the fight. Keep it up. So, um, today we're going to be going through a few advanced topics. I just want to give you a quick preview of some of the chemistry ideas. Uh, it's very valuable, uh, very useful, and I think it'll be uh, a good resource for you. Um, this book was written by myself and reviewed by one of my good colleagues and friends, Vincent Miranda. Um, so it's dedicated to tens of people who have helped and inspired me, specifically my parents, doctors, Ferguson and Ferguson, uh, my brother, attorney Ferguson, and my sister. Uh, it's definitely, and his wife as well, my brother's wife as well, and those teachers in university and high school who helped make science accessible to me. So let's just go over it. Again, chemistry is a subject that requires effort, focus, and skill. These foundations have been selected after guided review and observations as to what concepts facilitate and support a good understanding as a student progresses through this discipline in chemistry. These foundations from the moiety to the metallics highlight with conceptual focus key ideas, points and memory aids to support your success in organic chemistry. Learning organic chemistry is similar to building a house. It takes time, skill and persistent efforts. So let's begin. Of course, this will be an audio and a visual as well. Depending on how you learn, the goal for this episode is to encourage those who are studying organic chemistry. I know from personal experience that organic chemistry can be at points, especially organic chemistry one, challenging because you're adjusting to a new paradigm per se and you are adjusting to a new set of content. But the thing you have to remember is with strategy and persistence, you can make it through it and do well and do your best. So some objectives that we want to remember. We want to learn the key definitions. We want to understand key ideas and the relevance of lower start structures. And we want to understand some simplified quantum mechanical concepts. Organic molecules can be defined as multiple atoms associated or bonded together, made primarily from carbon. In short, organic molecules are carbon-based molecules. So we have the structure of cyanocobalamin, 
This is the structure I did my undergraduate thesis on, also known as vitamin B12. These molecules may or may not have the same molecular formula. In cases where the molecular formula is the same but the structure is not the same, you have structural isomers. Some examples include acetone and dimethyl ether. Note, uh, when the constitution or the connectivity is not the same, you have constitutional isomers. Where the arrangement in 3D space is not the same, you have stereo isomers. In some instances, constitutional is sometimes interchanged with structural isomers. Now, subclasses of stereoisomers. You have optical isomers, which are molecules that rotate light differently, and the mirror images are non-superposable. Non-superposable. Otherwise known as enantiomers, uh, and they are designated by E, Z, R, or S. Intagin, Zusamen, Rectus, or Sinister. Geome geometric isomers, which are molecules that have non-identical mirror images, um, it has to be a cis and trans, the arrangement around the plane of the double bond is different. Organic molecules can be linear. Linear molecular shape is observed with hydrogen cyanide or acetylene, or maybe planar, but, but trigonal, such as formaldehyde. Um, a bit of formaldehyde, the structure for formaldehyde is cut off. Um, the other hydrogen. Also, the molecule can have a 3D arrangement such as methane, existing as a tetrahedral molecule. So it's important to remember that molecules are multiple atoms bonded together and compounds are a type of molecule in which you have multiple heteroatoms bonded together. So the atoms are different in that case. So let's talk about the structure of 3D molecules. The structure of 3D molecules can be predicted using an application of correctly drawn Lewis dot structures, which is valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, also known as glepsin ion theory. VESPA, that's well one way to say it, involves valence bond theory, showing all valence electrons and including bonding and non-bonding electrons in some cases referred to as lone pairs, and maximizing separation in 3D space so as to minimize repulsions connected to Coulomb's law in the greater distance, in that greater distance minimizes potential energy, so greater distance between like charges minimizes potential energy, and the converse is true in that when you increase or decrease the distance between unlike charges, you also minimize potential energy. So VESPA is an alternative that can inform and start the journey in us understanding molecular geometry, whether it be the linear alkynes, the trigonal planar arrangements of the carbon atoms in some alkenes, or the tetrahedral arrangement of carbon atoms around some carbon atoms in alkenes. Another alternative involves using quantum mechanics that uses wave functions that are mathematical descriptions of electron probability distributions to produce atomic orbitals. There are some limitations in this method as it pertains to accuracy, as with the previous method, VESPA, considering the theoretical simplifications that I use. Overall, the goal is to gain a better understanding as to what occurs in nature. For example, for example with quantum mechanics, we can step into hybridization theory and use mathematical mixing of wave functions to further our urban understanding of what is observed in nature. With the same goal through ideas and valence bond theory, we can predict the bond angles for methane, specifically the intramolecular HH bond angle in methane, hydrogen, hydrogen bond angle in methane. There are deviations, however, that are observed, and hybridization accounts for those deviations with explanations. Those explanations entail the ideas that linear arrangements have carbon atoms that are sp hybridized, one, sp plus two p's trigonal plane arrangements have carbon atoms that are sp2 hybridized one sp2 plus one p and tetrahedral arrangements have carbon atoms that are sp3 hybridized one sp3 plus about plus zero p uh, other hybridizations occur less frequently in mainstream organic chemistry however with higher geometries common in common with in organic compounds there can occur trigonal bipyramidal sp3d or octahedral sp3d2. So note, quantum mechanics 
also involves the use of molecular orbital theory to understand other interactions, but that will be discussed later. With the same focus, quantum mechanics also enables chemists to speak on regional electron densities. Um, also, it's important to know that double bonds possess a sigma bond and a pi bond, and triple bonds have one sigma, two pi. So some questions you want to think about. What is organic chemistry and what is the historical origin of it? What is one class of organic compounds? What are three different types of isomers? Explain the valence bond theory in general simple terms. What is one molecular example where valence bond theory does not accurately explain what occurs in molecules? What are the hybridization of carbon atoms in acetonitrile? What are the designations of sigma and pi for the bonds in acetonitrile? So let's keep going. We're going to have a quick break and then we're going to continue talking about functional groups and other ideas. Okay, so let's go. Functional groups and other ideas. So you want to understand what is a functional group, understand the key format for organic nomenclature, and understand the role of intermolecular forces. Functional groups are characteristic parts of molecules that convey specific chemical properties to the molecules that possess them. Functional groups do numerous things, but mainly they enable us to compartmentalize information about molecules, compounds, and reactions. Functional groups do give us insight into chemical interactions, such as intermolecular interactions, as well as give us more information in understanding the properties of molecules. This includes the physical properties, boiling points and melting points, and solubilities. Considering the usefulness of functional groups, they also possess a characteristic molecular fingerprint that is detected in many ways, namely in spectra, so IR spectra, which really gives you a fingerprint as to the functional groups within the molecule, and that will be discussed later. So case in point, we have an example of phenol right there. So we have types of molecules and their properties. There are several types of molecules in the world. However, in the discipline of organic chemistry, there are specific molecules that are discussed frequently, including these. You have your alkanes. Alkanes, otherwise known as paraffins, are saturated hydrocarbons and aliphatic compounds. These molecules form a series of homologs with a repeating methylene unit and with the general formula CnH2n plus 2 and ending with the suffix "-ane". For example, in increasing order from 1 to 5, we have methane CH4, ethane C2H6, propane C3H8, butane C4H9, pentane C5H12. The following prefixes are hex for 6 carbons, hept for 7 carbons, oct for 8 carbons, non for 9 carbons, dec for 10 carbons. These prefixes from meth to dec are applicable throughout the naming of organic compounds, alkanes, alkenes, alkynes, alcohols, alcohols, etc. And there uh, are lots of ways you can code this information, even when it comes to heterocycles, whether it be ear, et, ear, et, et, Dash ep, ear et ep, dash ep. So there are lots of ways you can code the information for different heterocycles. You can discuss that uh, chunking on that mnemonic later. So ear, oxyrane, oxetane, oxane, oxalane, oxeptane, all those things. We can discuss that later. So alkenes, otherwise known as olefins are unsaturated hydrocarbons and they are considered aliphatic compounds. They contain at least one double bond, forming a homologous series with the formula CnH2n. These, these are alkenes now. These molecules end with the suffix "-en". So alkynes, otherwise known as acetylenes, are unsaturated compounds, having a triple bond. These molecules form a homologous series with a general formula CnH2n-2. These molecules end with the suffix "-ine". 
There are several other molecules that form a homologous series within their groups, including carboxylic acids and aldehydes. You also have alcohols. Alcohols whose main functional group for identification is the hydroxyl group. It is notably priority in nomenclature practice. Exceptions include carboxylic acids according to the IUPAC. Alcohols contain one or more hydroxyls forming a homologous series, CNH2N plus 1OH. Alcohols are aliphatic and typically end with the suffix all. So let's talk about intermolecular forces and other properties. With functional groups comes certain properties such as specific boiling points and melting points, as well as critical temperatures. The temperature around which a vapor is not easily uh, does not easily undergo a phase change to a liquid, and many other physical properties. However, beneath the surface of physical properties are the chemical features or interactions known as intermolecular forces, which influence and enable comparative predictions and physical properties. Namely, there are key forces to remember. You have your dipole-dipole forces. These are forces which occur between molecules, intermolecular, with a dipole moment or a significant dielectric constant. These molecules are otherwise known as polar. These intermolecular forces, IMFs, are relatively strong. A relatively stronger version of this is the H-bond or hydrogen bond intermolecular force. So you have your hydrogen bonding. It is a stronger force, sometimes referred to as a strong dipole-dipole force. This is a relatively strong, some consider it strongest, of the IMFs. It occurs in water and other molecules with hydrogen bonds to nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Then you have your iron dipole. This occurs between ions and polar molecules, for example, with salvation of sodium chloride crystals in water. Then you have London dispersion forces. London dispersion forces occur in all molecules and are based off of the columbic interactions between transient, in essence, temporary dipoles. These electrostatic forces result in transient interactions between molecules. Then you have Van der Waals forces. Now a weak force that consists of two kinds, including the Van der Waals force, which is discussed in short, is where um, more elaboration can be found in other texts, in other episodes. It is worth noting that IMFs and their strengths are based off of functional groups, chemical structure, and the types of chemical bonding in those molecules, so intramolecular bonding. So what's inside influences what occurs on the outside. Composition influencing function. Anyway, chemical bonding, you have polar covalent bonding. Covalent bonding occurs between ions with significant electronegativity differences. So this is polar covalent bonding. Specifically, this bonding occurs with heteroatoms, which refers to different non-metal atoms. So different non-metal atoms. Many times, the Pauline scale is used as a reference for ranges to determine the type of bonding arrangement occurring between atoms. If bonding, though considered a theoretical construct, is viewed on a spectrum, polar covalent bonding would exist around the middle. Then we have covalent bonding. This is also non-polar covalent bonding. This is almost at the other another end of the bonding spectrum where there is less significant difference in electronegativity. So then you have ionic bonding. This is at the other end of the bonding spectrum. This occurs between metals and non-metals. For example, in sodium chloride, there's a large difference in electronegativity. Salvation. Salvation is dependent on many factors, including the principle like dissolves like, and ideas such as hydrophilicity and hydrophobicity. Hydrophilicity and hydrophobicity. These terms refer to the molecule stands in relation to water, whether it has a significant affinity for water, hydrophilic, water loving, or less significant affinity for water, hydrophobic, water hating. The tendency of molecules is as follows. Polar and ionic compounds tend to be hydrophilic compared to covalent and non-polar compounds which tend to be hydrophobic. Nomenclature, according to the IUPAC, is based off of four main parts. 
prefix local parent chain suffix. The prefix is normally denotes the number of each substituent or functional group attachments. Prefixes include di, tri, tetra. The locant, which is the number that describes the functional group attachment or the substituent's position. The parent chain. This is normally the longest continuous chain in the molecule. The suffix. This is based off of the presiding or prioritized functional group chain or bonding arrangement, single, double, or triple. Suffixes are typically classical in ending, with ane referring to the alkanes, ene referring to alkenes, ine referring to alkynes, amine, amines, amide, amides, oic, carboxylic acid, eight, esters, own, ketones, dehyde, aldehyde. Key facts to note, the alcohol's functional group hydroxyl is normally prioritized overall. Substituents are transcribed or outlined in the name based on the relative alphabetical order, so ethyl before methyl, and that pattern continues. So key overall idea, and I'll repeat this twice. Prefix, locant, parent chain, suffix. Prefix, locant, parent chain, suffix. Prefix, locant, parent chain, suffix, generally. So you can look up further ideas about IUPAC nomenclature in other texts. So some questions to consider. What is a functional group? And name several examples of functional groups. What are three types of organic molecules? What is an intermolecular force? Explain dipole-dipole forces. What is one molecular example where intermolecular forces explain a physical property such as boiling point? What is one difference between hydrogen bonding and London dispersion forces? Explain the overall process of naming simple organic compounds. So if you want, so just an aside, quick aside, if you want more information into HeroCycles, there's a phenomenal chemist, his name is Dr. Barron. He has lots of resources out there for HeroCycles. So feel free to look into that very good resource, very brilliant chemist. So let's keep going. Concept development three, structures, confirmations, and projections. So one thing we want to do and, and also, just remember, this episode is primarily dedicated to those in general chemistry as well as those who are in organic chemistry with the thrust that we want to encourage and help each other as we go along in our scientific careers. So, objectives. Understand and be able to draw Lewis electron dot structures, condensed structures, and bond line structures. Understand and be able to draw different conformations, primarily those of cyclohexane. Understand and be able to draw and identify Fischer projections and Newman projections. So structures are diagrammatic representations of different molecules, and they provide a means of understanding what is occurring in nature. There are a variety of different structures used in chemistry. The main examples in this episode would be Lewis electron dot structures, condensed structures, and bond line structures. So Lewis dot structures, named after your boy Gilbert N. Lewis, a brilliant scientist. They are built on some key ideas such as the arms valency and the octet rule. There are specific exceptions for period three with sulfur and arsenic, for example, and beyond. Valency. Valency refers to the amount of electrons an atom will lose, many times resulting in a positively charged ion cation. Gain. Many times resulting in a negatively charged ion, anion, or share, typically occurring in covalent molecules, in order to have a stable, noble gas configuration. Ground state, of course. Valency can be determined using the periodic table. The group number, the vertical column numbers for main group elements typically in the periodic table is designated the valency. The valency corresponds normally with charge, oxidation number, and its subsequent sign is dependent on the type of atom, its reactivity, and what it is reacting with. So, key points to note. Valency can be shown quickly using Lewis dot structures and orbital arrangements can be explained simply um, in some ways with the Bohr model. The octet rule now. The octet rule is a principle with applications in resonance theory, simple chemical mechanisms, and reactions. The octet rule is based on the idea of atoms gaining, sharing, or losing electrons in order to have a complete octet. And in this context, we're referring to eight outer electrons. There are exceptions. For example, some ions may lose electrons to possess the electron configuration of helium, two outer electrons. However, for the most atoms, in period 1 and period 2, in the periodic table of elements, those elements obey the octet rule generally. 
This rule is helpful in predicting reactivity and explaining simply the rationale for certain chemical reactions. So from period three onward, there are exceptions. So let's think about the rules for writing Lewis electron dot structures. So NP stem, note the total amount of valence electrons, place single bonds between each atom, subtract two electrons for every single bond added, eliminate or note the remainder amount of electrons and minimize formal charge as best as possible. So for atoms and ions, consider the group number primarily an electron configuration. For molecules, start by determining the total electron count among the atoms and the molecules. Draw single bonds between each atom, subtract two electrons for each single bond, add extra bonds when necessary. For example, carbon oxygen bonds in aldehydes and ketones. Bonding arrangement is typically in the form of a double bond. Ladies and gentlemen, you must know and observe the trends. After all the necessary extra bonds have been denoted, subtract the correct amount of electrons for the extra bonds added. Typically with the remaining electrons, denote them as lone pairs around the relevant atoms. So let's keep going. Condensed structures. Condensed structures are important in the process of understanding what bond line structures represent and show. In condensed structures, all of the hydrogen bonds are attached to the carbon, for example, S2 bromobutane, you can see here. So bond line structures are the next step after condensed structures. These show only the carbon framework with each carbon represented by a bend in the chain and the hydrogen not denoted, but inferred or assumed to the point or a complete octet around the carbon atom. This means that hydrogens are not shown, but implied to the point that the valency of carbon is satisfied. For example, we see there, bond line structures are useful and efficient. They save time. We can see an example of a bond line structure right there for benzene. Now conformations. Conformations are molecules that differ only by rotations around single bonds. You may have heard of conformers, rhodomers, otherwise characterized as sigma bonds. These alternate rotations affect the potential energies of the molecules, either increasing as seen in the eclipse conformation or decreasing it as seen in the anti-conformation. Conformation's potential energies are attributed to ring strain, which is based off of the angle strain and the torsional strain. Angle strain is caused by the alternate bond angles that have deviated from the idealized bond angle suggested in Vespa. Torsional strain is caused by repulsion due to the dispersion forces, an intermolecular force, and this can cause steric hindrances. So as you progress further in your career in science, you'll hear the two whistling, whistling concepts, two echoing concepts in the halls of organic chemistry. You have sterics and electronics. So conformations can be experimentally described using a graph of dihedral, of dihedral angle versus potential energy. As you study this some more, you encounter things like carplus correlation, um, all of that are good stuff, a lot of good stuff. So typically cyclorexane is plotted showing the potential energy of the different conformations in there or in increasing potential energies. The chair, the twist boat, the boat, the half chair and the chair. Chair, chair, twist boat, chair, half chair, twist boat, half chair, chair. It's important when you start learning about this to be able to draw your chairs correctly. Chair, half chair, twist boat, boat, twist boat, half chair, chair. So CHT, BTHC. CHT, BTHC, chair, half chair, twist boat, boat, twist boat, half chair, chair. Projections. In chemistry, there are many types of projections. However, two that are frequently encountered are the Newman projection and the Fisher projection. So Newman projections are structures from a specific perspective. We look down a specific single bond between atoms and draw the other attachments in respect to those two atoms. For example, butane is drawn. So picture yourself looking down the axis of a single bond, C2 to C3 of butane, 
or C2 to C3 in some other molecule. Now let's draw the Newman projection. Here we see an example of Newman projection. Then you have your Fisher projections. These are typically seen with your carbohydrates and your hexoses and all those other good stuff. They involve another representation from a different perspective. The molecule is drawn from top to bottom, normally with anomeric carbon at a designated end. Generally, the functional group attachments are on the sides, which are seen as wedges that are of the plane of the paper. And the top and bottom of projection is seen as groups on the dashed. Another bond designation uses the squiggly line, which represents a single bond out and behind the plane of the paper. So the projection is typically used with carbohydrates, especially simple carbohydrates. So you can see an example of R, one bromo, one chloroethane. And then you can see another example of thalidomide. Plastic molecule, as is also discussed when we dis when we introduced the key ideas associated with stereochemistry and how important it is, even when it comes to medicines and the use and effects in the human body. So let's talk about some questions. What is the Lewis electron dot structure of oxygen? What are the key ideas for drawing Lewis electron dot structures? Explain the concept of valency. Explain the octet rule. What is one exception to the octet rule? Draw the bond line structure of anthocene. Explain the overall order of stability for cyclohexane conformations. Remember, we go chair, off chair, twist boat. Chair, half chair, twist boat, boat, twist boat, half chair, chair. Chair, half chair, twist boat, boat, twist boat, half chair, chair. CHTBTHC. CHTB. T H C for those who need to know that. Okay, so let's talk about chirality and isomerism. You want to know key definitions. Definitions of words such as isomer, chiral, and conformers. Understand the concepts of stereoisomerism, chirality. Understand the Lebel and Van Lebel Van Hoff rule. So let's keep going. Isomers as defined earlier. Are molecules with the same molecular formula but different in structural arrangement, space, connectivity, or geometry around the bonding arrangement. All those differences aforementioned define a subclass of isomers, be it structural, so structural isomers, arrangement in space, stereoisomers, or connectivity, constitutional isomers. Each subclass has its own significance. Stereoisomers or spatial isomers are molecules with the same molecular formula but different three-dimensional spatial arrangements. A stereoisomer has a stereogenic center, which is a location in the molecule where the interchange of two groups in space results in a new stereoisomer. A subgroup of stereogenic centers is a chiral center, which typically refers to a stereogenic center with a sp3 hybridization or tetrahedral geometry. Every chiral center is a stereogenic center, but not every stereogenic center is a chiral center. Stereoisomers can be further divided into other categories such as enantiomers, non-superposable mirror images, diastereomers, non-identical mirror images, isomers, isomers as a result of restrictions and bond mutations. Um, so enantiomers, enantiomers are optical isomers. These optical isomers are molecules that are non-superposable. Nantimers typically have chiral centers or a chiral center. Nantimers are very significant in the pharmaceutical industry with specific enantimers in drugs having specific effects. This is seen with the classic example of thalidomide, ibuprofen, and darvon, where stereospecificity contributes a large role in determining therapeutic potential and therapeutic effects. Nantimers are typically designated by the signets of absolute configuration, which are R, rectus, and S, sinister. Mixtures of both enantiomers are called racemic. Usually these are mixtures of equal proportions. The process of forming both enantiomers as products is known as racemization. And if you do some more research, you'll hear about Viedma ripening. You can do the research and find out about it. 
So the molecule is also designated by the relative configuration, which are dextrorotatory D and level rotatory. And that refers to the optical rotation, how they rotate light. So let's talk about assigning configurations. Dextrorotatory or level rotatory must be assigned experimentally, typically by the proper application of an optical device, such as a polarimeter. To observe and measure how the molecule rotates light and to what extent or degree it rotates it. Absolute configurations can be assigned using a priority numerical labeling system such as the Kahn Ingle Prelog priority rules. These rules give priority based on atomic mass. Larger atoms have the highest priority, and the smallest or least weighing atoms have the least priority, typically hydrogen in most molecules. So if you have hydrogen, typically it's going to be on the Okay, in the back of the plane of paper. And then your largest priority, the thing that has the highest priority is going to be coming out at you. Okay, so there you have S1 bromo 1 chloropropane. So let's talk about diastereomers. This is a subclass of optical isomers. Optical isomers, a subclass of optical isomers, known as geometric isomers. Diastereomers are isomers with the same molecular formula but different arrangements in space. That results in non-identical mirror images. These can typically be identified by first assignment of the absolute configuration of the stereogenic centers, then comparison of the mirror images to determine whether they are identical or not. So that's a suggested way you can do it. Subclass of diastereomers are cis-trans isomers and conformers, which can further be divided into rotomers. So you have your easy isomerism and your cis-trans isomerism. As dextrorotatory and level rotatory is relative assignment for stereochemistry, so is cis and trans. Cis and trans isomerism allows for the denoting of the spatial arrangements based on light groups, for example, trans 1, 2 dichloroethene or cis 1, 2 dichloroethene. This relative system, cis or trans, can become obscure very quickly. So, to provide a more meticulous system, the Kahn Ingold prelog priority rules are used to label the substituents on the double bond using entagen, E or opposite, and zusamen, or same side. So, entagen, E, opposite, zusamen, same side. This system, often mentioned, provides more clarity with stereochemistry. As stated earlier, the Kahn Ingold prelog priority rules give the highest priority to the largest substituent or the substituent with the greatest atomic mass. And the following substituents are labeled with the numbers 2, 3, 4 based on atomic masses. So you number your substituents. Basically, you assign your priorities, you number your substituents. It's good to do this with your modeling kits, your modeling sets. And if you can't afford it, you can use gumdrops and toothpicks. And just make sure you use different colors for different types of atoms. But assign your priority, arrange it, visualize it in 3D space. You may have to build a model. And from there, you see one, two, three, four. Rectus, one, two, three, four, sinister, it goes clockwise. If it, the substituents, if the substituents are ordered such that they go in a clockwise way, rectus, if they go, or they're arranged such that they follow a anticlockwise path or trajectory, we call it sinister. So conformers and rotomers. A conformer is an arrangement or conformation of a molecule based on a rotation or based on rotation of single bonds that resulted in a potential energy minimum. A classic example of a conformer is with cyclohexane, which you have different conformers represented in the graph below. A rhodomer is just a conformation of a molecule that results from another rotation of a molecule's single bonds. And you have the anomers, isomers, and isomer formed due to the geometric variation on the certain atoms in specific molecules. Anomers are typically seen and described in carbohydrates where the designation of alpha or beta is used. Alpha D glucopyranose, beta D glucopyranose. And you have the epimers. An epimer, normally found in diastereomeric pairs, is a stereoisomer that differs in configuration at any point in the molecule where changing 
decomposition of the two substituents results in the formation of a new stereoisomer. Basically, an epomer is an isomer that differs in configuration at any stereogenic center. So, Libyl van Hoff rule. If there are n stereogenic centers with four different substituents attached, there are two to the n different stereoisomers possible. So, if you have n stereogenic centers, there are two to the n different stereoisomers possible. Okay, so some questions to think about. What is an isomer? What are the different types of isomers? Explain the concept of enantiomers. What is racemate? And even further research, you can look into what is VMR ripening. And you can talk about, uh, or just look into what is a diastereoisomer. What are two club classes of diastereoisomers? And then we can talk about explaining the Kahn Engel Prelop party rules for designating absolute configuration. So let's keep going. Nucleophilicity and electrophilicity. In it for the long run. Learn the definition of nucleophilicity and electrophilicity. Understand the trends with nucleophilicity and basicity or electrophilicity and acidity. So we want to understand those things. Those are our objectives for this reading. Nucleophilicity is a kinetic concept that describes the affinity of an atom or molecule for the nucleus of another atom which is positively charged with the intended meaning of nucleus loving. So nucleophilicity, nucleus loving. This term is very important for understanding reactions and their mechanisms. Nucleophilicity refers to how willing, to what degree, or at what rate is an atom or molecule donating its electron density to another atom or molecule. The degree of nucleophilicity is defined by the rate of the reaction, specifically the rate of electron density donation. Generally, nucleophilicity, when comparing a similar atom in multiple molecules, uh, follows Lewis basicity for some contexts. Um, also, nucle and when a nucleophilic atom is different, there may be no relationship between nucleophilicity and basicity. So that's something to note. If the nucleophilic atom is different, there may be no relationship that you observe. Um, since dipole moments for each atom or molecule may be different, Thus affecting polarizability, which is a large determining factor in nucleophilicity. So polarizability of the electron cloud is a large determining factor in nucleophilicity. So it's very important to understand it. It's grounded in Columbic, it's grounded in Columbic forces. It can result in the formation or breaking of bonds as seen in the infamous nucleophilic attack and nucleophilic substitution. So let's talk about electrophilicity. Electrophilicity is a kinetic concept. It involves a reaction in which there is an acceptance of an electron pair. An electrophile is defined as an electron pair acceptor or an atom or molecular part that is electron loving, electrophile. This term provides insight into mechanisms or reactions such as electrophilic aromatic substitution, electrophilic substitution, and electro addition. Electrophilicity is, it basically involves the measured degree or extent, directly speaking, of how much an atom or molecule is willing to accept electron density from another atom or molecule. So, some questions to consider. What are some key ideas associated with the concept of nucleophilicity? What are some key trends with nucleophilicity? Explain the connection between Lewis basicity and nucleophilicity. What is the connection between Lewis acidity and electrophilicity? Explain the significance of PKB. Some aspects of the concept of nucleophilicity. So let's talk about spectroscopy and some instrumentations. Spectroscopy involves the study of the interactions of electromagnetic radiation and matter. Spectroscopy has a key role in organic chemistry. It contributes to informing many processes, including retrosynthetic analyses, structural elucidation, and total synthesis. Spectroscopy and spectrometry are different. Spectroscopy refers to the study of the interaction of electromagnetic radiation and matter, while for spectrometry refers to the measurements of the interaction of electromagnetic radiation and matter. So measurements versus just the study. You have UV spec. That's an example of a diagram, UV light stars, Going to your scanning monochromator, UV motor that's spinning, it goes to the sample cuvette, 
and you go to your detector, you amplify it, and then it's displayed. For your sample qubit, you also have a reference qubit as well. So UV based spectroscopy is an analytical technique that involves the use of ultraviolet or visible light in order to analyze a sample in a qubit. This technique can be used to quantify, detect, test, support, or support structure elucidation. And aids in determining molecular geometry and to study the kinetics of reactions. So when you think of UV vis spec, also think about Woodward Hoffman rules. One of the main ideas behind the use of UV vis spectrophotometers is the principle of absorbance. Um, you can look into Bayer's law and also you can look into so Bayer's law absorption is equal to epsilon molar absorptivity absorptivity constant. Um, B pathylene C concentration. Then you have atomic absorption spectroscopy. AAS, you go from your light source to your sample to your detector to your computer. It has many uses involving clinical, geological, biological, metallurgical, atmospheric, and also in the pharmaceutical industry. Then you have your IR spec. You go from your Nernst glow, this is just a version of it to the Michelson interferometer, to your sample, to your detector, to your computer. So IR can be used to detect the functional group moieties that exist in the sample, the relative location or proximity of the information, the relative location or proximity of functional groups, that information can be obtained. Um, it's based on the assumption that atoms behave as simple harmonic oscillators that each vibration uh, is occurring within uh, molecule. You have your NMR spec, in which you go from your RF radiation generator to your NMR tube to your RF receiver to your computer. NMR spec provides information on the chemical environment the nuclei of atoms are situated in. This type of spec is normally used in structure elucidation and, in some cases, structure determination. This analytical, this analytical technique involves several concepts. Some such as um, shim, all this other good stuff. So gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, you have your GCMS, you go from your sample holder to your capillary column, to your electron ionization, to your ion trap, to the computer. It's an analytical technique that involves both analytical techniques of gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. This is a method in which components of a mixture are separated using chromatography and analyzed and characterized using mass spectrometry. Gas chromatography is a separation technique in which chemical substances are volatilized and separated by their relative boiling points, which is dependent on the chemical properties of the molecules. Mass spectrometry is an analytical technique that involves the ionization of chemical species into different ions of different atomic masses and the sorting of ions into a unique spectrum based on their mass to charge ratio. So some key features are what are some key features of three questions are what are some key features of a UV based spectrometer? What are some key features with the infrared spectrometer? What is the Jacquinot advantage? So throughput advantage, explain Felgate advantage, multiplex advantage, explain the differences between polar and non-polar compounds in the GCMS instrument. So we can talk about inorganic and organic metallics. This is the first part. Diatomic halogens have chemical significance as seen in several areas of organic chemistry. Whether in the presence of light, organic solvent, or peroxides, they can result in the formation of halogenated variable groups, which can vary from alkyl halides to acyl chlorides. Diatomic halogens, when substituted in the organic molecule, can result in new properties both chemical and physical, stereochemistry, intermolecular forces, as well as conformations. Also, the chemical reaction environment also affects reduced in the reaction. Also, diatomic halogens can be used to test the presence of olefins, namely bromine, methane, alkene, and the result is a colorless solution. Diatomic halogens have versatile use in organic chemistry. So, several inorganic reagents are used as reducing agents or oxidizing agents to convert carbonyl compounds, carbonyl containing compounds, in primary and secondary substitutes. Car hydrocarbons to primary and secondary alcohols 
and in another direction it can convert alcohol to carboxylic acid. You have your sodium borohydride used to do a stepwise reduction from aldehydes to ketones to alcohol. So you have LIALH for thymolonohydride, very dangerous, flammable and powerful reducing agent that reduces carboxylic acids and other carbonyl containing compounds to alcohol. So you have PCC, peridium chlorochromate, which is used to oxidize. It functions to oxidize primary alcohols to aldehydes and secondary alcohols to ketones. Peridium chlorochromate is made by reacting chromium trioxide with hydrochloric acid to form chlorochromic acid, which is reacted with pyridine to form PCC. And you have the Jones reagent. It is an organic, inorganic reagent that is used to oxidize. It functions typically as chromic acid and involves oxidizing primary alcohols to carboxylic acids and secondary alcohols to ketones. The Jones reagent is a good oxidizing reagent. Then you have KMnO4, potassium permanganate. There's another inorganic reagent that results in oxidation of primary alcohols, carboxylic acids, and secondary alcohols to ketones. Always remember or consider the temperature at which that oxidation is occurring. Very important. Then you have PCl5, a molecule with many uses, namely the interconversion of carboxylic acids and acid anhydrides to acyl chlorides. Then you have sodium cyanoborohydride. It is used to reduct is used in reductive amination, resulting in the formation of amines from the reduction of the cyanide portion of the reagent. There are some arrange there are some rearrangements that occur when this is being taking place. This is another example of nucleophilic attack occurring. Meanwhile, sodium borohydride is serving serving as the infamous reducing agent. So some organic metallics, you have your grignants. Grignant reagents are some of the first encountered organic metallics for an undergraduate organic chemistry student. These molecules are composed of, organic, of an organic variable group, a magnesium atom, and a halide. These are normally used to attach organic variable groups to a carbonyl, meanwhile reducing the oxygen to a hydroxyl, thus making an alcohol. Grignant reagents are very useful, however, because these are reactive even with water. All material used in the reaction to avoid water contamination must be lab oven dried. And you also have Gilman reagents. Gilman reagents are gallocuprates attacking as a nucleophile to rings with an unsaturated region, alkenyl, or to an alkyl halide to form an alkyl substituted molecule. Then you have your regular nucleophiles such as metallic alkoxylates such as sodium ethoxide, magnesium ethoxide, which are used as nucleophiles to attack a variable group, whether in a SN2 or E2 mana, as well as in displacement reactions. So, here are some questions. What are some examples of substitutions using diatomic collagens? What is an example of an oxidized alcohol? Explain the use of sodium borohydride in reduction reactions. Where does the organoboring occur in the reaction schema and why is this chemically significant? Can nucleophilic attack serve as a means of oxidation or reduction? So let's talk about some radiochemistry principles. Understand the fundamentals of radiochemistry. Understand Markovnikov's rule and anti-Markovnikov's rule. So Markovnikov's rule, he who has more gets more. Anti-Markovnikov, he who has more gets less. Understand Zaitsev's rule and Hoffman's rule. So let's keep going. This will be the last section that we go through today. More to come later on. So regiochemical principles come from, regiochemistry comes from the Latin word regionum, meaning direction. Regiochemistry provides and describes the principles involved in the directionality of, or position and placement of reactants to form the product. Regiochemistry is very important. As you progress, you'll hear about things being regiodivergent or regioselective. Reagents used can cause a specific regiochemical result or result in the opposite of what would normally occur. So you have Markovnikov's rule, put simply, he who has more gets more. Markovnikov's rule is in the addition of a halide to an unsymmetrical alkene, the hydrogen goes to the carbon with the greatest number of hydrogens and the halide goes to the other carbon.
In other words, this rule states that the halide are so as to form the more stable carbocation intermediate. Then you have your Antimakovnikov, which is the reverse. He who has more gets less, in which the carbon with the greatest number of hydrogens does not receive the hydrogen but the most electrophilic portion of the molecule. For example, in hydroboration oxidation, in the presence of peroxides, the borohydride adds to the less substituted carbon of the hydrogen and the hydrogen adds to the more substituted carbon. Keep in mind hydroboration oxidation, which is done in the presence of peroxides. Or in this case, we're referring to it being done in the presence of peroxide. However, the stability comes about because the electron density shifts. This is one way to describe the mechanism. The electron density shifts to the electrophilic borohydride, resulting in it possessing a partially negative charge, and the more substituted carbon possessing a partially positive charge. This is indeed stable due to the electron density donating capacity of the alkyl group. In the discussions, we can talk about hyperconjugation. S character and the orbital overlap of the alkynal carbon. The alkynal group with the alkyl or electron donated substituent provides stability. So, Seitz's rule. Seitz's rule is the directionality principle in which the more substituted alkene is favored through the use of a small base such as ethoxide. Seitz's rule is significant and aids in predicting products in elimination reactions. So, Seitz's small base used to the more substituted alkene. So Zaitsev small and more substituted. So Hoffman's rule. Hoffman's rule is another directionality principle. So T Hoffman, in which the less substituted alkene is favored through the use of a huge or large base, such as tritium oxide. Hoffman's rule is also very significant in aid to predicting elimination reactions. So the Hamann left the postulate. In simpler terms, it's basically the view of the potential energy hill continues in some ways as you follow through the potential energy journey, or the product resembles the molecular arrangement of the transition state, or the step of the RCD, the reaction coordinate diagram that's closest to the transition state in energy. Typically, the transition state will, remember, will resemble that. So what does the word rigid chemistry mean? was an example of a reaction that follows Markovnikov's rule. Explain anti Markovnikov's rule. What is Zaitsev's rule significant? Why is it significant in elimination reactions? Explain the significance of the Harman Neffler postulate. Why are videochemistry rules helpful in studying mechanisms? So types of reactions. Let's just go through these. You have your addition, substitution, elimination, reduction, oxidation, and rearrangement. Addition, put simply, is like a traditionally synergistic relationship. The two parts become one. Two different molecules are added together. Addition can be driven by nucleophiles, nucleophilic addition, or electrophiles. This type of reaction normally occurs in regions of high electron density and bond order, which is seen in compounds with multiple bonds. You have your substitution. Substitution is, by definition, a type of chemical group replacement. This can be driven by nucleophiles or electrophiles as well as it can involve alkyl halides or aromatic compounds, SN1s, SN2s, typically some of the first reactions encountered by an undergrad in OCHEM. Then you have eliminations. Eliminations involve the loss of a group of atoms from a molecule. This can result in the formation of an alkene or alkyne product. Elimination tends to result in a net increase of electron density for a particular molecule, which, if considered, makes sense since the overall process of loss and gain of electron density, density is usually presented mechanistically. Um, okay, then you also have reduction in oxidation, classically paired process in which one atom or molecule gains electron density while another loses electron density, which is reduction in oxidation respectively. So oil rig, oxidation, loss of electrons, addition of oxygen, removal of hydrogen, increased in oxidation state or number, and then GLAD, cleaning of electrons, reduction is GLAD, oxidation is LARI, reduction GLAD, gain of electrons, loss of oxygen, addition of hydrogen, decrease in oxidation state or number. So you have reduction occurs in organic reactions such as hydrogenation using rainy nickel or lithium hydride. Then you also have your rearrangements, which typically occur through your 1 2 methyl shifts or 1,3 methyl shifts or 1,2 hydride shifts or 1,3 hydride shifts. Thermodynamic bases and rationale for these rearrangements occurring 
is that they lead to a more stable carbocation as a transition state or reaction intermediate. Many times the arrangement results in positive charge being situated on higher substitute carbons, is presented as secondary or tertiary carbons. There are other categories for mechanistic classification. Polar under basic conditions. Example is a nucleophilic substitution under basic conditions. Polar under acid conditions. Example is acid catalyzed hydration. about the background noise you have paracyclic an example is the 4 plus 2 cycle addition deals all the reaction the 4 plus 2 reaction refers to number of electrons specifically pi electrons and you can look into Huckel's rule each atom so cyclic planar each atom sp2 and it must follow Huckel's rule 4 n plus 2 pi electrons so if your free radical reactions, example is the free radical polymerization, metal mediated reactions. An example is the sodium metal mediated birch reduction. So some questions as we conclude. What are the key features of a substitution? What are the key features of elimination reactions? Explain the significance of rearrangement in terms of stability. And why is it important to know these types of reactions? listed in this concept development. So later on, we'll discuss different types of substitutions and different types of eliminations. But I want to remind everyone, you're not alone. In, we are all in this as a scientific community. Reach out to people if you need help. Get the help that you need. Strategize, plan, use the resources at your disposal. You can do it. People are rooting for you. Uh, keep up the good work. Glad to see that you're doing well. Hope everyone's doing well. Um, and this ends this episode of Lecture Chaos. Welcome to the New Chemist Podcast. Bienvenidos al podcast del Nuevo Químico. Carlos Irza, testo podcast tu New Chemist. Welcome by the podcast van the New Chemist. Bienvenue sur le podcast du Nouveau Chimiste. Bem-vindo ao podcast do Novo Químico. Welcome to the New Chemist Podcast. Work hard. Be value-driven. You can do it. You can grow and learn it. You can be the difference you and your community needs. Don't give up. We are here rooting and cheering for you. Don't give up. Travaillez dur. Soyez axé sur la valeur. Tu peux le faire. Vous pouvez grandir et l'apprendre. Vous pouvez être la différence dont vous et votre communauté avez besoin. N'abandonnez pas. Nous sommes ici pour vous encourager et vous encourager. N'abandonnez pas. Trabalhar duro. Seja orientado por valores. Você consegue. Você pode crescer e aprender. Você pode ser a diferença que você e sua comunidade precisam. Não desista. Estamos aqui torcendo e torcendo por você.
não desista. Δούλεψε σκληρά. Να οδηγείτε στην αξία. Μπορείς να το κάνεις. Μπορείτε να μεγαλώσετε και να το μάθετε. Μπορείτε να είστε η διαφορά που χρειάζεστε εσείς και η κοινότητά σας. Μην τα παρατάς. Είμαστε εδώ για να σας ζητοκραυγάσουμε. Μην τα παρατάς. Trabaja duro. Sea impulsado por el valor. Puedes hacerlo. Puedes crecer y aprenderlo. Usted puede ser la diferencia que usted y su comunidad necesitan. No te rindas estamos aquí animándote y animándote. No te rindas. Werk hard. Wees waardig gedreven. Je kunt het. Je kunt groeien en leren. U kunt het verschil zijn dat u en uw gemeenschap nodig hebben. Geef niet op. We zijn hier om voor je te roten en te juichen. Geef niet op. Work hard. Be value driven. You can do it. You can grow and learn it. You can be the difference you and your community needs. Don't give up. We are here rooting and cheering for you. Don't give up. Thanks for listening. We're glad you were able to tune into this podcast. Once again, this is the new chemist where we discuss chemistry, which simply put is the science of change, as well as the other sciences, careers, community, research, and COVID-19. Thanks again for listening. Note, the views on this podcast represent those of my guests and I. Thank you.